Our next speaker, Kirsty Asanovich, received a PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley in 1998 and joined the faculty at MIT, uh, becoming uh, pro associate professor in 2005. He returned to join the faculty at Berkeley in 2007, where he co-founded the Berkeley Parallel Computing Laboratory, known uh, affectionately as ParLab. He is currently director of the Berkeley Aspire Lab. He leads the free Risk Five ISA project. is chairman of the Risk Five Foundation and has recently co-founded Sci Five Incorporated to support commercial use of Risk Five processors. He is an associate director at the Berkeley Wireless Research Center and holds a joint appointment with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, Kirsty is going to give us a talk. Uh, about the Berkeley Adept Lab, which has been mentioned briefly already this morning, reigniting innovation in the hardware industry. Hello, could you hear me? Yeah. All right, great. Okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction, Jeff. So, um, so one correction there, the Aspire Lab has ceased to exist. Um, we had an end of project party in December, and what we're working on now is the Adept Lab. So this is a new lab, and the real focus is on how do you get uh, reignite hardware innovation? How do you get the Valley humming again with new hardware designs, right? And I'll go over the problems we see there right now. Um, there's a lot of faculty involved in this new lab, several of them giving talks today. Um, I want to go back, because this is about Moore's Law this morning. I thought it should be a good idea to go back and actually read what he actually said in the actual paper instead of what people think of as Moore's Law. So what did he actually do? He went and looked at what's the optimal cost per component and how is that changing over time? So these are the graphs from the paper. And what he's saying, at any given technology point, there's this kind of curve of you know, the optimum cost per component happens. You shrink the components down as much as you can in that current manufacturing technology, and they get cheaper because you're putting more of them on each wafer. But at some point, you make them too small, and your yield goes down, and you get fewer components working per wafer. So there's an optimal point for each technology node that reduces your cost per component. So this was really all about manufacturing. What's the cost of each transistor on each integrated circuit? This is what Moore was actually predicting. So he was saying, at the optimal cost per component, how does things scale? And he took his three or four points and drew a big line, and everybody decided that was the law, and they just followed <laughs> that straight line. And it's been wonderful over the last uh, 50 years or so, uh, this progression. Um, so we talk about is Moore's law dead now? I think. My message to you is it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter at all for almost every chip project. Um, you know, I, yeah, it's probably dead. But very few products, except you know, even in advanced nodes, they're, they're not really constrained by the marginal cost per transistor. Moore's law is about manufacturing. What's the cost per transistor at high volume manufacturing? That's not the problem the industry has. That's not why we have very little innovation in the industry. Um, if you look at... Um, Custom chip costs, to go understand this, let's divide in two categories. One is the non-recurring engineering costs. Somebody has to sit there with scalpels and cut the ruby lith, right? So that's one task you have to do. So that design and tooling for production, we call NRE, non-recurring engineering. Then you go into manufacturing. So then you are blasting bits of tin with lasers and doing all kinds of things to make these uh, incredibly dense wafers. Uh, that's your marginal manufacturing cost per chip, okay? So any chip project, any product, I want to build. Um, there's a very simple model I'll use here to explain what goes on. So you have a, I've got this whiz bang new AI chip that drives cars or whatever, and I'm imagining over the lifetime of the project, I'm going to ship this many transistors in the form of this AI chip, right? Um, when I'm doing my budgeting, I say, well, there's an NRE intercept, and there's a slope which is set by the cost per transistor, right? So if I'm doing my calculations, I figure out how many do I expect to ship over the lifetime. And what's my to total expected lifetime cost of using a given technology? Right? Very simple model of how I uh, design and build chips, uh, a budget for chips. Um, now, I would say the classic industry has been built around what I call the Moore's Law business model. Right? Um, the idea is you design a standard part for a killer socket. And everybody's wanting the next killer socket. It used to be the PC processor. Now it's the smartphone. The whole industry is really driven by very few products. The smartphones are driving the advanced fab. The other products really are just fill in later. You know, we got to do something with this fab now that Apple's moved to the next generation, right? Um, you sell hundreds of millions of parts. And your real ideal model here is you want one product, an infinite volume. That's the ideal technology. That's the ideal product for this technology, right? 
And this is why I call this a Moore's Law business model, because at infinite volume, all you really care about is the marginal cost per transistor. So this is why Moore's Law is on people's minds. I'm shipping all these transistors. I need to make them as cheap as possible. What's happening with Moore's Law in terms of cost per transistor? But if you look at what's happening to NRE, um, now th this is just some data from Handel Jones. What's the cost of developing new products? So across here, we have the decreasing feature dimensions from 65 to 45, 28, 20, 16. Uh, and the bar graph is broken down into the different components of the cost of developing a new product, a new chip. And what you see is, well, one thing is it's basically doubling each generation. So this is like the other flip side of Moore's law. You know, cost per transistor goes down by two. Cost of developing the chip goes up by a factor of two every generation. A large part is software design for all the stuff that's on the chip. Verification, there's a little bit of architecture. I'm an architect, so it's kind of sad to see this, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to get a big pay raise, right? There's not much. <laughs> People talk about mass cost, but that's this little bar up here, you know. That's like almost irrelevant at the scale of these projects, the amount of design cost that goes into developing a new chip. Um, and, you know, up here, you're looking at 300 million development costs for, you know, 60 nanometer chip. Maybe it costs five bucks to manufacture this thing, right? So what does that mean in terms of businesses that can use this technology? Well, you know, I'm going to have to ship 60 million units just to equal the NRE, right? So the NRE cost, at the point, it equals the manufacturing cost. That's 600 million bucks out there. I need to make some money on this, too. There's not many $1 billion markets, right? The whole, semi whole of semiconductors, including things like memory and everything, is like $400 billion, right? There's not many markets in that, in that space. There's not many single products that are going to ship enough to warrant these design costs. It just doesn't make any economic sense, right? Um, I mean, what used to be the case was you would have um, you know, Moore's Law scaling work great for standard products. I'd have some product on an older node. It's very cheap to develop for because there's not many transistors and the mass is cheap. Um, at a certain slope, though, the transistors were kind of expensive to manufacture. I went to the next node, um, more expensive NRE, but the slope was a lot better. Transistors were cheaper. So now at some volume of the crossover point, it was cheaper to use the new node than the old node. All right, and this is kind of what's been happening in our industry in terms of projects. Now, what's kind of sad is, with the end of Moore's law, um, the NRE is doubling each generation, and the transistor cost is also going up. So this is kind of what's happening, right? So, like, so there's no, if you just think about cost of the parts, there's no reason to go to these advanced nodes, right? There's just really no reason. So why do we have these advanced nodes at all? Well, one thing to realize, very few people are playing in this space in the advanced nodes. Across the industry, the number of new chip starts has been dropping over the last decade or so. This is kind of well understood. Um, the other thing that's happening in the industry, all these mergers. So in the last few years, we've had seven out of the eight of the biggest mergers ever in the industry. Um, you know, and there's fewer and fewer companies. So we're hitting this space where only the megacorps can design chips. And that's really sad coming from a place that wants to foster innovation. You know, you don't get innovation from big companies, right? It comes from small companies, small startups, grad students, people coming out with ideas. If all we have is a few companies left who can afford to do custom chips, then silicon ceases to be a place where you get any innovation, right? That's the big worry. Um, now, the thing is why I'm not worried about Moore's Law. If you look at CMOS at the end of scaling, as an architect, I look at this and I think, this is amazing. This is wonderful, almost magical technology. The things you can do with CMOS right now are just incredible. You know, you can fabricate billions of transistors. Um, you can connect them reliably with wires, right? This is amazing. This is a mature technology. Billions of wires reliably connected. Forget about the transistors. I care about the wires. The transistors don't do anything until they're wired up, right? You can clock it at gigahertz. You know, dissipates less than 100 watts if you're sensible, even on the big high-end chips. You know, very high yield if you're clever about redundancy in your architectures. Anything this big has a lot of redundancy in it. Um, and the best thing is, you know, it costs only a few bucks to make this thing, right? So you can get all this stuff done and manufacture this part that's incredible for a few dollars per die. So this is magical technology. It's amazing stuff. Um, so manufacturing is the least of our problems in terms of innovation. It's not, you know, I, we don't need, I'm, I'm glad everybody's working on these next generation devices, but in terms of products and impact, this stuff is amazing. We just need to be able to use it as a barrier to using this technology, right? Um, so what's been happening, though, it's not just the traditional semiconductor companies. The big companies who use stuff, who have products, they've been looking at this. And there's a new vertical semiconductor business model emerging, right? So instead of these guys going out and buying the standard product from the Moore's Law business companies, 
they're developing their own. And they have a reason to because their value from that chip doesn't come just from selling a chip with some margin on that chip cost to a consumer of the chip. They have a whole business that relies on the capabilities that custom silicon will give them. So for example, Apple and Samsung do this. They design their own chips for their own products. Apple doesn't really care about how much profit they make on the chip because they're not selling the chip. They're selling a $1,000 iPhone. So if that chip design will give them these new capabilities, they can get the value, they can get the profit from having built that custom chip that makes this new product possible, right? Google, Amazon, they're building their own chips for the data centers. They can see the ROI for them is they build this custom chip, they can suddenly offer services like speech out in the cloud um, at lower cost, so they can make a profit that way. So the custom silicon is enabling this new application area for them. You know, rumors, Tesla, Uber, these guys are developing custom silicon for their cars. One <laughs> quote I heard was, every car is gonna take about one sixth of a wafer, right? Six cars per wafer. It's a lot of wafers, right? So IoT products, Fitbit, at the low end as well, not just the high end products, small products. If you're worrying about form factor size, power, you're motivated to develop custom parts. So if you look at end system value profit, this is what's justifying the NRE, right? So the standard product business model isn't what's justifying the high-end parts. It's this end-to-end -end vertical business model that's justifying this investment. But what about the non-huge firms and the startups, right? You know, you, you, unless you're doing an AI chip right now, you cannot get funding to do a semiconductor startup, right? How do you get that NRE down to you know, less than 100 million, less than 10 million, less to a million bucks to do an advanced chip? How's that gonna happen? Well, that's the thing we have to solve because right now, a few of the industry is in this perfect storm. And the perfect storm comes from right at the time when there's all these new applications that really demand custom chips to hit their performance requirements. So AI, machine learning, autonomous vehicles, all the hot topics. You know, storms happen when cold systems, cold air meets hot air. And the cold air is the cost of doing custom chips, right? So in this point, just at the point where we need all this custom stuff, it's way too expensive for almost anybody to develop it, right? So how are we gonna, how are we gonna bridge this? So that's really, you know, my, my idea, we need a new law. Forget about Moore's law. The new law we need is for equal QOR, can I drop the NRE trans per transistor by a factor of two every 12 months, right? If you do this, the cost per project will scale just like it did with Moore's law, right? So this is, the, the, you know, that's the dominant factor. This is what we have to work on. And notice that the NRE was doubling every generation while the transistor count was doubling every generation. NRE per, trans per transistor has not been dropping, right? And that's the real problem, productivity problem for the industry. Right, so, um, so the great thing about this law as well, if you actually do this, you don't need infinite volume uh, to sustain a new product, right? So that allows this big diversity. What people are seeing, the problem right now is transistors are everywhere in all different shapes, forms, and sizes. You wanna customize for all those different niches. Okay, so the goal is, you know, this is what we'd like to do. With the old design stack, it looks like this. We'd like to keep halving NRE and reduce that cost per project and make it the entry point affordable for startups and really get innovation going. What are the new silicon products that people really want to build? What are the products that rely on the custom silicon? Right? It's not just a standard part, it's some end product that needs custom silicon. That's what we have to, to work on. So this Adept Lab, this is what it's all about, is how do we reduce that um, cost per project down, or the total cost of getting a new silicon-based uh, thing out in the market? And so this is, uh, great, very grateful to Intel, they were they're providing the cornerstone funding for this. Um, uh, and also to DARPA, who are funding this through the, the CRAFT program, which is CRAFT stands for Circuit Realization at Faster Timescales. And through a lucky coincidence, the CRAFT program was called AHADEPT with a H. Um, so we folded that into this same lab. And we have several sponsors, Google, Siemens, and SK Hynix, and we're happy to talk to more of you about joining. Um, so in ADEPT, what we're trying to do is attack all these NRE components. And I'm just gonna go through a laundry list and quickly go through some of the technologies uh, but please come by the Adept House later, Open House later, to talk to us in depth about this. So to drive this, we're looking at two big application areas, the data center and uh, embedded vision processing. Um, we're really interested in reducing the software cost. If you notice, that was like a big, one of the big poles in the tent there in terms of overall NRE. How do you reduce the cost of writing applications that make use of customized accelerators? And our motivation here, our, our approach here is really go up, use high level programming languages that can synthesize code that can drive these generate, uh, generated hardware accelerators. So um, that's one approach. So at the um, high end, we're looking at serverless programming models in the data center. So 
What's nice there is you can insert custom hardware without the programmers even knowing it's there, right, the data center scale. And at the embedded vision, we're working with uh, Jonathan Rag and Kelly's in the lab looking at Halide uh, programming system for high performance uh, number crunching. Um, to reduce the cost of architecture and verification, we're building on our previous work on Chisel and Fertile, which are a new hardware description language we developed here at Berkeley. Um, we're also uh, working on verification and validation by using the new innovation as FPGAs in the cloud now. So instead of buying expensive emulation systems, things like you know, Palladiums or um, Veloce from the big CAD companies, you can rent FPGAs in the cloud for a few dollars an hour. And so we're working on tools that let you just use those to speed up your emulation. Um, we're also, uh, with a large group, looking at um, speeding up the generation of analog mixed signal. When you, come to, when you come to do real chips, realize the digital stuff is easy. It's all this analog mixed signal stuff that's really hard to get, to get right, especially if you're changing nodes. And so we're working with those on building generators that let you quickly target new nodes uh, with uh, analog mixed signal blocks. Um, we're also, one of the other big things we see is to get high QOR, you have to really work on back-end physical design. And so working on tools to help automate that as well. So really end-to-end -end from applications and software development all the way down through to uh, circuit design is really what we're trying to do in this lab to really reduce the cost of building a high QOR um, custom chip for a new application area. Um, so one of the components in cutting the cost as well is um, if you go build chips, you realize license fees uh, kill you, and there's some monopolies out there that uh, are especially uh, painful to deal with. So one of the things we did back in the Par Lab and the Aspire Lab is come up with a free and open standard instruction set. If you realize the instruction set is really important, it's where software meets hardware. And so you need an open standard there to encourage, to allow people to build their own processor implementations while leveraging a common software ecosystem. So this is what we've been doing with the RISC-V ISA. Um, hopefully many of you heard about this already. It's a, you know, we designed this at Berkeley. Most people who've been using this view it as actually quite competitive with the other industry ISAs, but it's, it's a common standard now. And the great thing about this is if you can, if you're a, uh, somebody trying to build a chip, you can go pick this ISA first and then later pick a vendor. What we trouble you have right now with proprietary standards, you pick some vendor and you're stuck with their instruction set and all your software is tied to this instruction set and you cannot go to somebody else. If you do a second generation chip, you have to go get the, the cores from the same company because it's proprietary. So we're really opening this up and this is a way of reducing cost and allowing innovation as well. So a lot of companies have been adopting this RISC-V ISA. We created a foundation. We have over 100 commercial companies as members now uh, out there using uh, RISC-V uh, or, or working on RISC-V, including some big names like Google, Samsung, Huawei. Um, uh, you know, NVIDIA has announced that all their future GPUs will use RISC-V ISA. Western Digital has announced they're transitioning all their products to RISC-V. So this is really um, happening in the industry. Um, one other thing we developed in the previous lab was Chisel, a hardware construction language. This is a way of making program, uh, hardware designers more productive at producing their designs. Um, so the Chisel HDL, we open sourced as well. A bunch of companies are experimenting with this. Google has said they actually did shape out a chip using Chisel as a HDL. Um, so this is making it out there into <coughs> industry. Um, and part of the methodology we've also been developing in the previous lab is agile hardware development. Can we make chip design go faster? Can we make it look more like the, the timescales of agile software development. And um, we've been sort of doing this inside Berkeley because we had to. We only have a few grad students and tape outs kind of come along when we get a donation of some fab. So we had to be very agile. And so the methodology we developed is to always have a fabricatable prototype, always have something you can go tape out and incrementally add features to that instead of the traditional model of here's my feature list and just you know trudge on for three years building this feature list onto a chip. Can you always have a... Uh, a version that you can go fabricate any point in time and quickly go through all the steps all the way down through physical design as well on, on the chip. So this agile methodology we use a great success. Um, one of the components is this, we built a, a chip generator. So this is using Chisel, a complete generator for a whole SOC we call rocket chip. Uh, this rocket chip generator includes processor cores of various kinds including in order and out of order cores and vector units, cache coherent memory systems, uh, I.O. devices, fabric on the chip, and this is all open source. Many companies as well as universities are using this now to do chip development. It lets you add your own, uh, change the parameters of the generator, add your own accelerators, developing your RISC-V cores, and fit into this framework. And at Berkeley, we use this to develop a whole slew of chips with a small group. Um, I think we're up to like 17 chips now we built in the last few years with you know, like a dozen grad students total. And these are complicated multi-processor <laughs> systems that boot Linux, have vector accelerators, 
have interesting physical design challenges such as on-chip DC-DC converters or photonics that Vladimir will talk about next. Um, all designed with this flow at Berkeley using uh, uh, just a few grad students. Um, some of the research topics we're looking at are new kinds of programmable architecture, uh, idea called Verge. So this is an extension of classic vector machines, but now you can operate not just on 1D vectors, but on 2D matrices or other shapes, as we call them. So it's just a, a glance at some of the architecture work we're doing in the lab as well. On the data center side, we have a vision of building what does future data center machines going to look like. We call this vision Firebox. Um, and this is the idea is many thousands of SLCs, maybe, maybe customized applications, um, very large bulk memory using the advancements in non-volatile memory and other technology, very large bulk memory that's shared by all those SLCs, and then a very high bandwidth optical interconnect that connects all those SLC sockets to all that bulk memory pool. Um, and so Vladimir will be talking about the photonics piece of this, which is what we're relying on to build this very flat, large bulk uh, memory system at data center. Um, another component here is, though, inside those data center sockets, we expect those SLCs to be customized. So you're already seeing this with the data center providers, um, Google with their TPUs, uh, Microsoft with their FPGA accelerators, other projects that are ongoing in the big, big, big machine guys uh, to build custom chips for their workloads. <laughs> What's interesting is as all the computing gets aggregated in these clouds, suddenly you find there's this function that you're doing enough of across all these hundreds of thousands of users that it makes sense to do custom silicon just for that application instead of buying lots more standard part servers, right? And so this is what's really interesting is can we have a standard architecture to easily plug those accelerators in um, to the whole system at the data center scale? Now to model this, one thing we're doing which is um, Sounds a bit crazy when I explain to people at first is we're actually going back to our methodology. We want an agile design methodology for a whole data center cluster. So we figured out how to model at the RTL level, cycle by cycle, a thousand server chips running by using those FPGAs in the cloud. This is building on earlier RAM technology developed at Berkeley a bunch of years ago uh, with some other university collaborators. But we have actually now be able to run a thousand quad core server instances using the RTL you can take to fabrication and model this cycle by cycle at sort of a 10 megahertz simulation rate, right? So this is um, some of the simulation technology we're developing, and this is what we're using to prototype uh, the new accelerators uh, for the cloud, uh, cloud market. So just to kind of summarize, this is a, we always have a lasagna stack for our, our labs. I'm just showing you, I don't want to go through this in detail, but we're looking at a bunch of important application areas. We're working with the RISE lab in the data center application areas um, and high-level programming models, and really looking at how do you, how do you really cut down the time it takes to get from a concept for a product to working silicon with high QOR? That's really the focus of ADEPT, to really kind of reignite this innovation in the hardware industry. Okay, that's it, thanks. The mergers is, is, uh, is very partial in the sense that I worked closely with Avago, I mean, Hock Tan, who bought Qualcomm and Train. Now, he cut all R&D inside his company. And he goes, looks for 10 startups, and picks the what, 10th startup that's successful and throws away nine. So I believe the opportunity is much more now for startups. But the biggest problem is that we can't do skunk works anymore. I mean, the, after FinFets came, nobody gets data. I can't do a feasibility chip on a FinFets because it, everything is so... Uh, so secretive. You know, even in my own company, I can't get the models, I can't get the things. So nobody can do skunk works anymore now. That's why it's so difficult to start a company. Uh, somehow if you can, I mean, this is gone of the era when Berkeley used to give source code for spies freely and people pretend companies, you know? No, we so lost that, we lost yeah. that. Yeah, I'm right? a big fan. I think open source is an important part of innovation. No? The fabs are obviously... So after FinFets came, everything has become such a, a secretive thing that we can't do anything anymore. You know? mm -hmm. We can't do any skunk works. We can't start a company. That's the biggest problem I see. Well, I don't know. I I'm, I'm, I'm difficulty naming like 10 semiconductor startups who were recently funded. So I don't know if they buy 10, they bought all of them. I well, I would, but, <laughs> like but previously, we would actually do moonlight and do the stuff before we got the funding. We would have the right. thing ready. We would have the feasibility done. But I can't do that now, right? I can't get the models for FinFed. I can't get the layout rules. That's the biggest challenge, that you can't, don't let individuals come out and disrupt, right? Yep. No, I think, I think we can work on um, fabs yeah. to do Help. Like back in the old days. And, and then I, I hope when you say NRE costs are cutting down, not engineer salary, but you know, wafer costs and stuff like that. <laughs>
No, I think NRE design, yeah. the goal is you need to cut NRE so that the same engineers or the smaller group of engineers can produce a given product, right? So I think you can't, if you need 100 engineers, you're not going to be that innovative. You cannot get 100, it's really hard to get 100 engineers to innovate because they'll spend all their time in meetings. So. <laughs> Yeah, but this chips, billion dollar chips, I mean, they need a huge army of very large people there to finish is, that, you know? There are two different aspects to the problem. One is NRE that Kirk's had talked a lot about. The yeah. other is really just getting access into the foundry, and this yeah. is like Moses 2.0 sort of company. Right. There's a few companies that are already moving if in this direction. If you're not yeah. mining bitcoins, you can't get any access to foundry. Uh, you just need to group enough people to get it. That's kind of <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think another thing, you don't, a lot of it, uh, a lot of innovative products do not need the most advanced node. They really do not. There's a lot of innovation happening in 180 nanometer. Correct, but the money so, is there. And then people go to the next node because there'll be zero yield with that die size in the current node. That's why they go there, not because they want no, to. No, a lot of, right? it, it, you don't only and get Unless you offer it on big that. Chips, big yeah. chips are not the only way to have innovation. Correct, but the cool checks ideas. are written by NVIDIA's and Apple. They're making a 40 nanometer node. I got to give something on that, right? Okay, I think this discussion yeah. probably needs to move to the, uh, <laughs> right. after the talk session. We'll have a lunch. One or two, one another short question. My question is, uh, you set up this uh, great goal, you know, get the NRE down from 300 million down to something, but you didn't tell us what something was going to be with all of these great innovations. What, no, what's I think realistic? Depends on your node, but I think, you know, you, sh you should be under 100, uh, 100 million to get a chip done. Under a million? Yeah. You should be. You, yeah. You think we can get there? Yeah. That's fantastic. Okay. Yes, one more. Uh, just... If you could expand on how you handle the mixed signal aspect of this. You're about to You'll hear a talk from a lot. Right. Eric? Uh, I guess we have really have time to <coughs> answer this, but are we done with Thomas Sewell's algorithm? <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a topic of hot debate. There's, there's two approaches. You can dumb down your processes and share them, or you can keep your processes super smart and not share them. And I think that's going to be... The current the CISC risk debate going forward is isolation architectures versus sharing architectures. Which wins? Is it better to not share and go faster on each one or share them and go slower? So, my two cents. All right. I'd like to uh, thank Kirsty for inspiring all this.